Okay. Hello, everybody. It's uh, hopefully you can uh, hear me. I can see the participants starting to arrive. If there is any uh, problem with sound or with image, uh, please let me know. Uh, let me organize this here. Uh, so the chat should be open and we can use that. I tried to pivot from all the different bits and pieces here. But yeah, feel free to to interact. Oh, you can just wait till, till towards the end to, to make some questions. So let us see this to everyone. Let's try that. So that's the first hello in the chat webinar. Hello, Maria, all good? Thank you, thank you. Hello, Kiran, Magdalena. Rowan, I can see you, so this is working as it should. That's nice. You never know with these things. We're all used to <laughs> to teleworking and teleconferences, but you never know until it does happen. <laughs> Hello, Karin, Luke, Mara. Bonjour, bonjour, buenos dias. Good morning. Oh, no, good morning. Uh, I don't know many other languages. Uh, Buonasera. Cosas del directo, you bet. <laughs> okay, so uh, we just wait for a minute to, to allow people to, to arrive. Um, uh, you are obviously free to, to come and go as, as you feel you need to. Uh, and by all means, feel free to ask any question. And if you don't get to ask your question during this uh, session, uh, you can find me in LinkedIn or whatever and, uh, and send me your questions. So, excellent. It looks like this chat function is working. I can see more people coming in. And you should all be able to see. Oh, look, uh, sorry, I cannot even read that. Iva, pa, Iva. Oops. Uh, I, I wish I could understand even how to read that. <laughs> it's finished. I, I thought it was because there's so many diacritics in there. Okay, so we have now 24 people and it's five past. So I'm going to start. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. And now I'm going into the presentation mode, which you should all be able to see as well. So that's that. Yeah, everybody can see this, I hope. Move this to the side. Excellent, thank you. I can see your icons. So if, if you if you do the emoji icons, I can see whether you are following or I'm failing to do something right. Always helps. Thank you guys. So recording is on. Thank you very much. So how languages turn video games into a multi-billion industry? If you are already oh, okay. Let me minimize the chat. Uh, so that should be a bit better. Otherwise, I miss, I lose you. Uh, so if you're already working in translation uh, or mediation or interpreting, uh, or even if you're a language teacher, you, you probably don't need, you are converted, you don't need me to tell you this, but the video game industry, and of course, any industry would be a lot smaller without translation, localization, adaptation, in other words, without the help of professionals like uh, like you and I, polyglots that can bridge the gaps between countries and cultures and languages, et cetera, et cetera. We know this, business people know this, they just don't want to acknowledge it and sometimes they don't want to pay for it. But that's the business game, you can't argue with that. Anyway, I uh, don't want to preach. Uh, so, 
I wanted just to focus because many of you maybe don't like video games, which is fair enough, or you don't know anything about the video game localization, which is quite complex and has grown a lot in the past 10, 15 years. So this is just to show you the main points why you may actually want to work in this area uh, directly or indirectly for an agency, directly for a developer publisher, or with your own company uh, providing the services to these other developers and publishers that need all these games translated and distributed around the world. So let me begin with this. Uh, very often, oh, I don't even know where to put this. Very often, uh, video games get a, a negative press, and and that's within reason. I, I would say that uh, many video games are actually quite bad, boring, copycat, uh, uninspired. <laughs> but uh, um, there, there are reasons. Uh, video games are can be addictive, and actually, if they are good video games. Uh, they should make you want to play some more. The addictive side of it is is more the pathological side. Um, and there are other links with it. And there are some game developers put in those games some mechanics that are basically gambling mechanics uh, that are no good. But anyway, uh, any kind of media and any, any kind of thing can be addictive. And I just wanted to get this out of the way. Yes, it is true. Some people do have problem with gaming addiction, but most people don't. Um, I've never been a gamer myself. You might be surprised to know. I just play some games when they are fun and I stop playing when they're not fun anymore. Uh, and I think video games have a place like, like movies, film, music, dancing, playing cricket, golf, or pool. It doesn't matter what it is. That's the pastime. But anyway, what's interesting is that video games can be very rich media products. And in that sense, they are uh, very varied. So you might be surprised to know that this chat box is going to be annoying me all the time. Never mind. <laughs> Most video games are actually adequate for children of, of all ages. So you have about 20% of games that are rated for seven years old or older, 25% that are rated for three year olds. Uh, at 22% that are rated for 12 year olds, 16. So that like you can see, if you thought that all video games are just about stupid, mindless killing, uh, that's not the case. That's a very small proportion, and that will fall within the 18 plus rating, which is 16% or less as years go by, actually. Because as you could imagine, the this making gains for this market basically sell sells less copies. So why would companies spend so much money to sell so few copies? Obviously, they want to make games that are adequate for all children. And I give you this ISF address and this PEGI address when you can get uh, reports, industry reports, and this type of analytics if you uh, are concerned about it. It's good for parents. It's good for translators. Uh, it's good for agencies to learn how it all works and where the markets are. So make a note of these websites. There are quite a few more. Nowadays, there are quite a few. Anyway, let me go to this next one. If you know nothing about video games, um, you probably only know that it began some time ago with Space Invaders and Pac-Man, and then it continued growing and growing in a crazy manner. Uh, it has been up and down, and there was a, almost a collapse of the whole industry. But then around the 90s, they started to get their act together and they started to do what they call uh, FIGS or EFIGS. And many of you would have known that acronym. So initially, all games were obviously in English because computers could only do English. And then it, it was a bit of Japanese as well because Japanese were very big in development. But they would release their games in English. Uh, so Pac Man, uh, Pakuman, actually in Japanese. Uh, was released in Japanese with English characters and then also uh, translated into English. That remained like a very shallow and boring market until the mid 90s when they started to do EFIX, so English, French, 
Italian, German, and Spanish. And the size of the market there was reasonably nice. Uh, it was probably 60 million uh, globally, uh, sorry, 60 billion. But then it, as they started to add more languages, and we uh, saw the, the advent of mobile gaming, then the market really started growing to the point that uh, we are already past this figure of 165 billion in 2020. And it's not only because there are more platforms, there are more games, there are more languages, and there are just more possibilities of engage with this interactive media. And you could say, well, so why do I care if I am a translator? The reason why you care is because they need uh, they need you guys. They, they need you guys to make the thing happen. This is the, the link uh, to this uh, graphic where you can see the analysis. But more interestingly, if you like hardcore uh, statistics, I suggest you use this Waterhouse Guide Press Coopers, uh, which they release a yearly um, report on the industry. And this is how much it is expected to grow for 2026. Again, these are billions of dollars. Casual gaming, PC gaming, console gaming, and integrated video game advertising. Might be surprising to you, but yes, there is advertising also within games, in the graphics and in many other things, like similar to product placement in movies. So PricewaterhouseCoopers, very good source if you like hardcore data. The biggest countries uh, or the countries with most growth, obviously, China, US remain big, Japan, South Korea remain big, UK, India, France, Russia, Germany, Mexico. These are all in billions. And again, you can see enormous growth. So even if the video game market has not stopped growing for the past 30 years, it, it always grows. It may grow by a 5%, by a 10%, by a 15%, but it grows. And it's just the variety of interactive media. Regarding where we get involved, uh, translators, linguists, mediators. I just wanted to show you a, basically a very simple graph of uh, what a game development process would be. So you have a product manager and they normally have a national develop, uh, development team, national or at least located in a particular country and city. Although nowadays many teams are distributed as you would expect. So you have obviously programmers, game designers, graphic artists, uh, audio artists, game writers, and game text testers. This will be functionality testers. So does the game play work or not? Um, then, uh, so the video game is developed, is tested. If they like it, they release it and then they localize it. So normally localization has been relegated to a post-production uh, space or the post-production uh, cycle of the game development, which generates uh, quite a few problems. The thing is the localization of MIAS, Multimedia Interactive Entertainment Software, which would be the long name for it, could not be tackled like passive media. For the very, from the very beginning, the translation of video games was just that, translation of game text just like it would be the translation of a book, a, a, a novel, or the translation of a manual. Obviously, a video game is, well, it's all that. It's interactive media. It's entertainment. And it, it is multimedia. It's not only words written on a page. So the thing is, developers and publishers didn't really understand translation co-creation, localization playability, or interactive cultural immersion. If you like video games and computing, uh, user experience, you kind of understand these things better. But uh, the, the simple way to, to explain it is, well, basically, enjoying a book and enjoying a video game are just two different things. And translating a book is necessarily different to translating a video game because it's multimedia interactive entertainment software. That may be very obvious, but you need to come up with a workflow that actually helps with that. And the thing is, um, each country 
for example, rates video games differently. And you would say, well, isn't, isn't that silly? Doesn't it depend if the content is the same? Well, the rating should be the same. And you can see the exactly the same game here. In one country, rated 12. In another country, rated 16. In another country, 17. And in another country, 18, 18 plus. Uh, this is not because they're going crazy. This is because each country has a different regulation. And not only the legal framework is different, each country has different appreciation of the content of that game. What's the story like? What are the characters like? Who is friends with who? What are these characters talking about? Are they friends or are they lovers? Uh, what amount of uh, violence is, is there in there? Uh, do they use swearing? Is there any reference to history? Is there any reference to religion? Is there any reference to sexuality? So the video game content necessarily, even if you make it science fiction, and you would say science fiction has no nationality, well, it does. The imagination for science fiction in the US may be different to the imagination for science fiction in uh, Japan. So each nation narrative challenges localization and developers and publishers of video games cannot assume and should not assume that their content is going to be received as they themselves understand it because it's just a different country, different language, different culture. This obviously is, well, this is obvious for us, people who work with languages, but it's not obvious for game developers. If you look at the type of work that uh, you guys will be involved with, or my students go ahead and do, uh, a video game has a great variety of assets. And the game assets uh, in, could include, obviously, anything that is text, so dialogue, menus, help file, installation wizard. Um, it could be uh, the graphics. The animation, it could be the music. All of these elements may need uh, to be localized. They may need reconsideration. They may need someone with cultural and linguistic knowledge of that particular target locale to rework and to think where are players in this country, are players in this locale going to appreciate or enjoy this, or do I need to change it? And from the point of from the point of view of linguistics or the stylistics of the texts involved, there are many different types of texts. So as you could imagine, a video game product is a piece of software uh, that is supposed to be entertaining. So there is narrative text, there is a dialogic tell text like in theater, there's technical text for the technical functionality of the hardware and software, didactic texts like in manuals, etc. So from the point of view of translation and stylistics, there's a wide variety of, uh, of text to translate, uh, which my students love to do. And also, um, if you are a teacher, uh, you could use this wide variety of text as a way of getting them started in this type of products. But uh, you will find things like, oopsie, uh, so this is, from, for example, from Professor Layton versus uh, Phoenix Wright. And you find this type of challenges in video games. So typically, video games, there's a lot of fantasy. There's a lot of imagination. There's a lot of quirkiness. There are puns in names. Um, and that, that's part of the fun of playing the game. It's not only that it has pretty graphics and that it goes click, 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 click every, every time you do it right. It's the storytelling, the characters the puns in the names, uh, all these things, there may be songs, there may be riddles, all these things are part of the attraction of making a video game interesting. And necessarily, these are uh, the examples in English, French, Italian, German, Spanish. So what I was telling before about ifix. And you see how the when the name of the character has a particular meaning or purpose within the story, then obviously you as a translator, you need to do something. This is still the case. Uh, it's also the case in if you translate literature, if you translate uh, some type of, of journalistic media, 
uh, but it's even more important in video games because video games are, they only have one purpose, they have to be fun, they have to be entertaining. And very often in video games, like in fantasy literature, the name gives you a clue about the role of that character in that imaginary world. So you will be doing a disservice to the players if you don't fix that. Obviously, this takes time to do. So you don't sit down and become creative uh, in two seconds. But uh, this is part of the fun of doing video games. So this is part of the co-creation that I was referring to. Co-creation is the translators of each language need to really uh, co-create. They don't need to be slaves to the source text, to the original. Uh, they just need to be able to free themselves and create a similar experience in the target locale or the target language. Uh, some translators have a problem with that, and some companies do as well. But that's the only way that you would actually honor the, the creative effort of the development team, which is part of the fun. Uh, in video games, again, uh, different from passive media, passive media I refer to as literature or film because there's no interaction, uh, there's just consumption. Uh, video games already live in an interactive uh, interactive world and an um, internet hyper-connected world. So whether you play on consoles, on mobiles, on your PC, you are already in the internet. You are already connected. So players will immediately, within seconds of noticing that they like something or that they do not like something, they will immediately uh, go to the internet and blog about it, write about it, complain about it, put it in the company forum or the game forum, uh, join other players. And this is a beautiful example uh, for the players of Club Penguin in Brazil. Club Penguin uh, is, was a game for children, uh, teenagers, adolescents. And these uh, players in Brazil, the ch children in Brazil, they got together to say, well, we want a Brazilian server for Club Penguin. And they were saying this because they were having to play in English. And because of that, some of their friends in Brazil that could not read or speak English uh, were not playing with them. So they went ahead and did this type of demonstration on the uh, game forum uh, several times. And eventually, they did get a Brazilian version of the video game for them and their uh, friends. So that speaks to the power of the player, the power of the user, the consumer, if you want, and how, again, um, games are slightly different to other media, to passive media, just because games already live in the internet. They already live uh, in, up in the cloud and complaints are very easily made. And actually some people just like complaining anyway. So players in other countries uh, may feel abandoned if they are not well catered for, and rightly so, because they pay just as expensive prices as the prices you pay in this country. Uh, I could go, but I want into the semiotics of video games, uh, but I just wanted to show this slide. So if you look at here, I, I talk about unidirectional media, novels and film, they have a message, there are many layers of communication, and that go to the reader or viewer. The reader or viewer may understand what they read or may not understand what they read and see, but it doesn't matter because the media is unidirectional. If you don't understand the novel, if you don't understand the film, you continue or you stop it, but that's that. Uh, video games are bi-directional media. There is a game machine. The game with, is constantly putting out messages in different layers, written, spoken, images, music, whatever. And the player is understanding them and reacting to them, pressing the button, and then the video game will do something else in reaction to what the player has done. So anyway, you don't need to go into this if you don't want to, but it's quite an interesting area if you want to do research on it or understand what I mean with uh, the playability side of things. In any case, just to highlight, although translators will focus on this, written language and spoken language, the image, the music, the sound effects, 
uh, even the touch proprioception and equilibrium perception may be subject to change during localization. It might not be a translator like you, uh, but it may be changed for a variety of reasons, and you can ask me about it if you want. So co-creation is necessary for localization playability. And you have something like this. So this is an example that I like using because I think it's a very, very visually clear example of it. Uh, so this is uh, from the game uh, Batman, and he's fighting the Riddler. If you know the Batman universe, one of the enemies is the Riddler. So this guy is crazy, and he's always sending Batman riddles to, to answer. And this is just an example. Hit me, hit me hard and I will cry, but you will never stop me from staring back. What am I? Well, I am a mirror, obviously. But if you see uh, this uh, six spoke wheel, you have, can see that there are the beginning of six words and these are the end of six words. So you could do me rush instead of me roar. And you say, well, so so what? Well, what do I care about that? Uh, because you need to, in your language, recreate this game. And you need to recreate in a way that matches the challenge, the difficulty. Uh, which means that you will need to come up with your own riddle, uh, with your own words. Uh, that's a different type of translation. I'm sure you would agree. Uh, so that's an example, the same example in Spanish. In this case, is Espejo. The same example in German, which in this case is obviously Spiegel. So you can see how that can get very complicated very quickly. Even more complicated is when you get to talk about linguistic variables. And linguistic variables, if you remember uh, when you studied maths and physics, variables are those things that we don't know the value of, you know, x, y, z. But you can also have variables when it comes to uh, localization or languages. So in this case, you can see how this is a linguistic formula uh, and the logic of it, you can see is, well, an adjective and a noun from the name of a band at the name of a venue. And you can see this, uh, the newspaper front page, and you can see how it works. The formula work outstanding or decent adjectives the noun it could be show it could be effort from uh, well in this case cyclone is the name of this band and Montgomery is the name of this other band this is the name the players actually input and then at the name of a venue so in this uh, game which is guitar hero you probably guessed uh, in this game you go to different venues to play so depending on where you're playing uh, that name of the garden on Rock City Theater would change. Now you could say, well, that's, so what? Well, obviously this formula works in English because of the characteristics of the English language and the linguistics, morphology and syntax of English. But if you have to adapt this formula to your language, probably it doesn't work. I did this for Spanish and I, it gave me a headache because obviously Spanish is more complex and this formula doesn't account for it. So yeah, linguistic variables, which are quite necessary in video games to create the illusion of a dialogue, they create many problems during localization. And you'd be surprised how quickly it becomes really, really unmanageable. Programmers, really hate it when we raise this up because uh, this is a big it's a big discussion to fix it, I, even more so if you think that uh, they're trying to do 20 or 30 languages. Anyway, let's move on. So localization was integrated in game development when they finally saw that the, the big money was outside of what they were already doing. They started to Let's see, no, not there. Uh, they decided to integrate it. So the the graph that I showed before, the, the organigram I showed before, now is that the localization beta begins once the beta version normally uh, has been um, released. So if you head of uh, beta testers, you know you can be a, a gamer, you can be a beta tester. A beta tester is 
the type of player who is okay to play the game when it's still broken. There are many bugs in it. Uh, so, but one that version is okay, then the localization uh, beta version can uh, begin. And the point of that is at the point of beta testing, the game is almost, it's not finished, but it's quite finished. So some of the levels uh, you can be confident that are uh, complete or they, they have been locked down. They're not going to implement any more changes. So the translation uh, can uh, start. Sometimes they go back and they change a few things, but they won't be that many. And that allows for companies, uh, publishing companies, nobody are responsible for that, to uh, start uh, engaging with all the different agencies in all the different uh, locales, countries, so that they can hit the release date at the same time, what they call SIM ship or simultaneous shipment. That's very important. All the language versions need to work at the same time about four, six weeks after the original version so that they can hit the release days, typically before Christmas, before Easter, before summer. That's a very crazy timetable. Uh, but yeah, they tend to make it work. And obviously part of it is uh, passing the rating boards. So um, this is just as a reminder, uh, and also because I think it's quite interesting, of what different rating boards around the world consider an important moment in the age of, or in the development of a child. So for some countries, so PEGI is the Pan-European Game Information Agency, uh, it's, it's independent. Um, so for PEGI, there are these five moments in the development of a child, three, seven, 12, 16, 18. But for other countries, uh, like in China, there are these eight, 12, and 16. And for other, there's uh, more precision or, or less stages in between. So the ESRB, for example, is the American one, Entertainment Software Ratings Board. Each rating board obviously goes with the culture and the legal framework of each country. And they do differ. And they do differ. Um, you could say it's normal that they differ. Uh, if you want to analyze clinically, uh, well, I don't think you can because all content, and even more so, all entertainment content is deeply, deeply linked to cultural uh, appreciation. And that obviously depends on the history of each country, et cetera. Some games uh, and some countries do enforce this type of descriptors. Uh, these are the descriptors that uh, PEGI enforces. This is the Pan-European Game Information. And this is, it means that whenever you go to, to the website or you see the box, you should have the information about the age recommendation and what type of content is it. If there's gambling, if it, there's fear or horror, uh, if there's use of drugs or access to the internet and pay uh, transactions. So you should get that you as a consumer, you as a parent, should be able to assess the game within two seconds of uh, looking at it. And then you know whether it's for you or not. Very interesting. And based on this age rating, the localization may change. Because if a company is wanting to go to a country and that country is more strict, the company will make the decision Whatever's in the original, you guys, you translators, you localizers, you localization manager, make sure this language version does not go above the 12 plus. It needs to be a 12 plus, otherwise we lose money. So that happens. That's very common. Now, the localization strategy finally changed. So, uh, and this has, hasn't been that uh, long ago, so I would say this is. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, some companies are still trying to figure it out. But what's important here is that localization, localization QA, quality assurance, and localization and accessibility, so uh, subtitles for the deaf, and even uh, some allowances for 
um, different degrees of vision impairment, they're all now part of the development. They're all now in pre-production and production. They're not done in post-production. This is the only way they can manage to do all the things early enough to avoid all the difficulties that they used to have. Also, because now the standard is not four languages, the minimum is probably 12 or 15, either full localization or partial localization. And in the top titles, they may do 30, 40 languages at the same time in parallel. So there's an incredible amount of translation and coordination that goes around. This type of uh, organigram now, uh, it means that all the localization is completed. Then the compliance is done for the whoever is the carrier or whoever is the platform, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, Apple uh, phones. And then is this same ship, the simultaneous global release. That's what's changed in the past 10, 15 years. And some companies are still learning about it uh, reluctantly, because obviously this needs a lot of thinking and a fair amount of money. But they, this way, actually, they end up saving money. So video games return on investment grew thanks to localization, which also, at the same time, grew the language services industry. And you've probably seen this graph. Uh, if you haven't, this is from NINZI. They release reports every year. And this is the size of the language services industry uh, overall. Uh, so whatever type of translation, interpreting, or mediation you do, uh, this is what, uh, what you will be included. So this language industry, this language services industry could grow obviously because there was a demand from the game industry, uh, but also the game industry grew because the language industry uh, professionals like you and I uh, were providing these services more and better. Uh, in some cases, well, as they say, as they call it in the industry, a one-stop shop. Uh, which is what many companies try to do. So, uh, okay, this video, for whatever reason, is not working. But anyway, nation requirements, what I was saying before, affect all content. So the fact that, for example, uh, I don't know, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Probably not. Okay, never mind. Uh, so if you know something like League of Legends, or this type of game, um, uh, MOVA, multi, uh, massively uh, online uh, multimedia game. This game, so for example, it, this was designed uh, for China and they have many Chinese characters and Chinese heroes. When they decided to go ahead and do a Western version or a version for the Western countries, Europe, US, they took those Chinese heroes and characters from the Chinese hero mythology and history, they changed those to something that Europeans could uh, relate to. So in this case, they chose uh, superheroes. So, you know, they put Superman and they put uh, Wonder Girl and uh, whatever, and Batman, uh, just to so that the European players or Western players could relate to those. So when I say this is, don't think that it's only the translation of text. Is not only the translation of audio files with the dubbing, voiceover. Uh, the graphics can change, the characters can change, the story can change, the humor can change, even the mechanics can change. Uh, so there are many things involved in it. You, as a translator, uh, will be involved in some of the steps, but not others. You could also be involved as a consultant, and you don't do the translation, you just check the content, which I have also done. So just to give you an example, right now there's been the, well, right now, we're in the process of creating more and more uh, jobs, professionalized, dedicated to, uh, to all these jobs that are required for the localization of video games. And whether it is in managing, engineering, translating, accessibility, testing, consulting, branding, designing, development, voiceover, or community engagement, all of these, these all of these different job titles uh, would require uh, that are necessary nowadays, especially for the big titles, 
they uh, would require someone like you, a polyglot, someone who is bilingual, bicultural, who is uh, proficient with computers, who don't necessarily love games. You don't need to be a gamer, but you understand games. You understand how they work. You you can you can work with a with a gamepad. It doesn't put you off, and you understand what is the player experience. What is the the UX, as they call it in the in the industry, the user experience. So all these jobs are out there uh, for people who want to specialize in video game localization. These are some of my publications in this area. Um, you have quite easy to find it. You can write to me if you know if you want. And that is all my content. And I would prefer that you have questions and then we can talk about it. So let me close this and we can go into the dialogue. Oh, oh there, where is it? Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is all in silence, which is a bit of a pity, but here is the chat box. Uh, I suppose I could, can I? I can promote to panelists if you wanna put on the, the microphone, but let's just begin with this. Rowan, Rowan says, you mentioned how localization has started to be involved earlier in the development process, yes. I was wondering if there are any ways in which this is progressing even further in terms of internationalization of design. Yes, yes it is. So developers involved in localization experts during the base design process so that things like user interface and mechanics are more localizable to begin with. Yes, there are uh, So some of the better companies, I would say, or some of the companies with the most experience are starting to implement that, if only, to properly internationalize the game design. Internationalize the game design means that already when you are doing it, you as a programmer, as a coder, as a head coder in this case, you are aware that there are other countries that have other requirements because of the writing system, because what part of uni Unicode they need, uh, because the mechanics they may want more of this and less of that. So you already, program it with that variability. So you only need to tweak it at the end. Uh, there are, that's not the majority, that's still the minority, but some companies have started doing it. One clear example is what happens with the translation of user interface of menus. Typically, we all know uh, that different languages take different amount of space, depending if they are an alphabetical language, a syllabary language, or a ideograph language. It may take 50 pixels, 100 pixels, and that's just natural in that language. So the design of the user interface and the menus, that's still a big thing. Um, it needs to be integrated from um, game design uh, very early on. Uh, Rowan continues, big developers probably have international markets in mind from the outset nowadays, but that might just extend to things like ratings. So do you know if there are any interest on this? No, for sure. And uh, so there are companies that specialize on designing UX, uh, user experience and user interfaces. And by now they cannot claim, 20 years ago, they could pretend they didn't know. But by now all companies know that, yes, different languages need different space. So the same menu with Spanish, English, German and Chinese is three, four completely different screens. So, so different. If they don't integrate Unicode in it, if they don't internationalize properly the design, uh, it will fail and it would just look weird. This is something you can see in all games. Uh, you can still see that in new games, all games that are being developed by people with little experience. If you take that from the console and the PC to the mobile world, mobile world, so a smartphone game, that's even more complicated because smartphones, although the screen in pixel resolution is similar, right, 1080p, uh, but the size is so small, again, the user interface needs to be uh, reimagined uh, because playing on a smartphone, which a lot of people do, to my surprise, I don't, uh, <laughs> the 
the, the, the user interface needs to be redone. Lorenzo says, how and where can you find or learn about localization related jobs and openings? Should you contact the gaming companies? Yes. So there are agencies uh, that specialize on, on software and technology. So I can I can think of uh, chain job. I can think of uh, Gamma Sutra. Gamma Sutra has a, a space for jobs in the game industry. They're very specialized. But any rating agent, sorry, not rating, any um, jobs agency typically advertise for jobs. By all means, do go to the company's websites directly. Um, so, you know, Square Enix, Nintendo, PlayStation, Ubisoft, Blizzard, ZD Project Red, go directly to their website and they will have a space for careers, jobs, opportunities, vacancies, and you will see the job descriptions there. Uh, I would always recommend, and as this is what I tell my students in, in the masters uh, I convene, check everything. Check the companies you like that make the games that you would like to work on, or the companies that have the type of content that you would be good at translating. So for example, uh, if you like baseball, that's an asset for you. So therefore you want to contact uh, take two and electronic arts because you say, well, you know, I could translate your baseball games because I'm a fan and this will be easy for me and you can make more money. So go whatever is your specialty. If you love reading literature, well then go to the companies that made the type of games that are more like role-playing games, more literary style games where you can use your uh, your literary uh, literature is, is stylistics uh, when writing your turn of phrase etc um the same applies for serious professional games so you may maybe you like um, flight simulator because you like flying planes or you like the idea of flying a plane and you happen to know that technical jargon for the engine and for the aeronautic or whatever well they you go again, it will be Microsoft uh, doing the flight simulator games. So yes, there are agencies that specialize. Uh, there's uh, probably also in places like uh, Eurogamer, they sometimes have um, job vacancies, but directly to the companies, I would say, uh, is also what I would do first. Uh, that's what I did too as well. There's not, again, the entry level jobs in this industry would be, um, language quality uh, assist, uh, quality assurance, so LQA, or linguistic quality assurance. So you are a linguistic tester. Basically, you are play testing the game and proofreading at the same time. Um, then you can also apply separately as a freelance translator, working uh, per project, per hours. Uh, from home or from wherever you are. And then if you are able to commit to more time and you are physically near the company, then uh, you can go to the premises, wherever they are. Here in London, where I am based, there is, most companies are around here. So yeah, uh, it's not, if, if they're not inside London, they're in greater London. So it's all within the transport network and it's reasonably manageable. And this will be the same in all big, uh, big cities, I would say. You can also work, uh, as I have done, as a, as a uh, consultant. So in that case, you would be checking the contents. Uh, that would be the, the story, the characters, the premise, uh, the interactivity, all, all these variables. Some of it is language, but some of it is not. Some of it is just culture, content, perception of that. Uh, obviously, in my case, I work with, with Spanish, so it will be um, either Spanish related in, in a general sense, or the difference between Castilian or Latin American Spanish, uh, Peninsular Spanish and Latin American Spanish. And there are many varieties there. The same applies to, to French and German and, and, and many other things, even English. They can have different versions of English. Okay, any other question? Any other question? 
No, all good. Did I talk too much and you are sleeping now? <laughs> No more question? All good? Shall we leave it there? Okay. Well, thank you very much for everybody who attended. Uh, if you want, uh, like I said, you can uh, contact me in, in LinkedIn and um, enjoy. Video game localization has lots of opportunities for everybody, really. Excellent. Thank you, Kiran, Martina, Rowan. All the best. Take care and uh, enjoy the networking. It's a three-day event. Ciao, ciao.